So this is part two um, uh, from my previous video where, where I, as I was filming, I realised that I had too many books to talk about and that I really needed to get off my chest a few more. <laughs> so this is uh, me just diving straight into the rest of the reads which I've read over summer. So in the second part I want to start with Amelia Abraham's uh, Queer Interventions. So this is a very personal journey through LGBT culture um, and she does actually express in the title that's a personal history and I thought that was really appropriate and suitable for what she's doing with this book and she seems really sensitive and aware that um, her lens and her experience is her own and regardless of all the people that she's reached out to and spoken to those are um, a window on the world and it's not a definitive guide to the queer experience um, and I just felt she was being really thoughtful and respectful to a lot of different parts of the queer community. We are just a weird, wacky bunch of people who are so unique and different to each other. Um, but in that celebration of a true rainbow, there is just heaps of difference which can be celebrated within the queer community. So in terms of the fact that she makes it a really personal reflection, at the start of the book it goes from the point of her going through a, a bit of a messy breakup and her talking about those experiences which you can definitely kind of <laughs> relate to and hear and see what she's kind of going through. And actually, like, she's clearly the type of person who is courageous and willing to take bold steps for love. And um, it you hear the, her heartbreak in that process which um, immediately draws you in and makes you warm to her but then she goes through this process of trying to unpack what it means to be queer today and she does it by visiting um, several different places and different elements of the queer community and it's just her trying to size up what's going on uh, as a con contemporary conversation um, uh, and I just thought it's super slick and smart what she's actually achieved and it's something which I want more of the community to read so we can start having conversations about where we go are going as a community and what values do we represent now. Um, I particularly like how she did look at elements of pride and um, because uh, having gone to both Manchester and Worcester Pride just recently um, the comparison between the two of them was really stark in terms of the sheer volume or number of commercial enterprises which were supporting and endorsing Pride in Manchester. Like there were swathes of like different banks and like local property housing associations and, and there was hardly like proportionately it felt like there was much less representation in terms of local communities. But what was noticeable is as like people were in traffic through, the, the crowds surrounding and watching those a part of the marches were really clapping and supporting those local community representatives and just accepting and allowing and embracing all the banks that kind of went through. Because you also know that those are allies and those are family and friends and um, members of our community who are all there championing and supporting us and also financially supporting Pride itself. So that was like interesting to hear how those elements uh, were being discussed because she goes over to Amsterdam and they're having some of those conversations and she presents different sides of the argument um, in a way which is very conversational. Um, and it's something which I do really um, appreciate and understand in terms of the complexity of that, that we do need endorsement and sponsorship to enable us to have support for rights and for um, being able to be present and visible in such a, a, a celebrated way. She's doing a lot of really cool things within the, the book really and it just made you think about where we are as a, a community and where are we going as a community. And to like just to put that in comparison to Worcester which is so much smaller. It's kind of like historically a more conservative area, but there was this real presence and vibrancy of local community. And it felt like a pride in my heart feels more like locally um, grassroots level, vital in terms of that uh, reaffirming sense of community around you that says we are here and 
were proud to be here and look at us all collectively. So it was just really nice to come to Worcester being in from outside the area and going, wow, this is the extent of the local community around me and these these are my people. And it felt like a real welcome into the area. Um, so it, and it gave me a lot of heart in terms of uh, having nervousness about coming into Worcester and wondering uh, how people might react to me uh, being around here and just gave me faith that things have moved on progressively from when I was in high school, when I was more local towards Gloucestershire. And I'm sure Gloucestershire has moved on heaps and bounds as well. It's just like when you move away from a particular area, you kind of go back and you hold on to some of your experiences, which might not have been the most pleasant. And it kind of t tarnishes your um, way of thinking of a place. And I think a lot of us do that when I've spoken to other people in terms of holding on to those previous negative experiences um, and but it does just kind of give you faith that things have moved on for smaller communities and not just these big urban centres as well. Next one which I want to talk about is SAFE on uh, which is on black British men reclaiming um, space which is by um, Derek Awurzu. So he uh, actually is from Manchester and um, he lectures um, over at Manchester University and has edited this um, range of black male voices. Listening to an interview um, uh, by him, he's really like stating, you know, we, we, we need to really start reclaiming space. We need to start controlling our narratives. Um, and so that's a real difference of like where the starting point is in the conversation as well. But as a collection of different stories from different um, black uh, male perspectives, um, the styles are so broadly different to each other. It's really nice to actually just hear a real range of voices and a real range of perspectives of um, just uh, issues and thoughts and interests, which are like just uh, not something which you necessarily hear about normally. And he has um, he, in this interview, he did really state that he is trying to talk about the subjects which aren't discussed. So every conversation I had, I just said, want the conversation that that essay to be as nuanced as possible. Want, I want you to look look for something that you haven't read about somewhere else, or something you're scared to talk about, and just talk about it. Because um, I just I was conscious that this could potentially turn into a book on masculinity only. Yeah. You know what I mean, or a book on fatherhood. And I just thought those conversations have been had for a long time. There are bits to add to it, but there's other things yeah. that we just ignore talking about that we need to talk about. I think the so, masculinity yeah. debate's kind of expired. Not expired, but it's like been kind of beaten, yeah, yeah, yeah. beaten to a pulp at the minute. It's just continually being talked about. So I feel like mm. that's what's so great about this book. Yeah. There's so many different things like that you've put that the black British man experiences that just haven't really been spoken about yeah. and that people kind of trivialise as well. Um, there's one really good chapter about being a prisoner on the streets and that really breaks down what it means to be mentally a, um, a part of a system and, and a prisoner to that structure and then actually breaking away from it for yourself and finding your own path forward. Um, and there are just elements in it which was just really insightful and really interesting to learn and discover and really gain um, more sense of um, understanding from what it means uh, to n not be white and what it means to actually grow up with that experience. And there was also a really empowering chapter called, uh, which was all about uh, black greatness um, but also the kind of things that they're um, casting away from themselves and what it actually means to suffer and to go through something and to fight for yourself and to um, want to better yourself. Uh, I mean, it's dealing with a lot of different things and there were so many elements which I just like underlined and caught for myself. But this is a book which I wouldn't necessarily have picked up. It was just that it was available on display at my local library so it's that, that in terms of just the the power of being in a library space that gives you the opportunity to um, be introduced to a different book which you might not necessarily um, come across normally. <laughs> it's also like a relatively short read I think it was only about 200 pages long and what was nice is there was also a last contribution um, from a new emerging writer as well so I just thought it was a, a great piece of writing which is really 
um, relevant and uh, contemporary in its tone. So the next one which I want to talk about is Ian Foster's Where Angels F Fear to Tread. So after recently reading one of his books I wanted to read more and I've got another one in my mind to read soon, um, Howard's End, which I'm hopefully going to be doing with a buddy read potentially with Milena. Uh, over from She Gathered Books. This is uh, one of those uh, writers who I felt like I really should have read more of, so I'm really trying to make a concerted effort to, to do more of uh, his reads. So you uh, start off with following uh, Lydia who's um, gone over and had a bit of a holiday romance with um, uh, this young and handsome Italian and um, her brother-in-law is sent over to try and uh, um, persuade her to come back before she gets herself into trouble. Let's just say he was unsuccessful with his endeavour to bring his sister back um, and he, uh, he has to kind of explain himself and that whole situation where he's talking to the mum is just brilliant. You've got like some really wonderfully um, portrayed characters uh, who are brilliantly vividly described throughout that passage. Um, so he ends up going back with the reinforcements of his sister Harriet and really that that second half of the book is about their adventure together and what happens while they're spending time um, and all the things that occur. I don't want to spoil too much because uh, something that's nice about where Angel First to Tread is um, when I went into it I really didn't know anything about it and it's the type of um, drama that just keeps on revealing itself slowly and little twists and turns happen throughout the, the story itself and you never quite know exactly what's going to be happening next. I can imagine at the time it would have been quite a risque book really overall um, but I loved everything that happened in it and and actually the, the kind of lead male character, um, what's his name? Phil I want to say? Yes, Philip. Um, Philip's not particularly likeable uh, <laughs> uh, and he's very opinionated and judgmental um, but all the things that happen to him through the course of his time while he's over there um, just makes for great reading <laughs> um, and it does make me uh, more excited for Howard's End because I believe that one is more distinctly queer in the way it's written um, and I, I kind of thought where Angels Fear to Tread was Howard's End so it's kind of one of those surprises where you're like, oh, that wasn't queer at all. And then it's like, oh, but it's still a good read. So I'm still looking forward to reading How It's End to, to get to the, the juicy queer stuff. Another one which I read, which actually ended up being a re-read, which I thought was actually not a re-read uh, at the time, but George Orwell's Animal Farm. So this is actually a book which I read back in uh, secondary school. I, I think I must have been in about year seven or eight. Because um, it was only once I was actually reading it, I was like, oh, I have actually read this. Because um, it's actually a relatively short book. But it feels really appropriate to be reading it right now, particularly with our political climate at the moment. Boris and all of the things that he's doing. <laughs> um, probably enough said, but yeah, not a fan. Let's just put it like that. Um, and oh my god, it just uh, when you make comparisons between our current government and the pigs within Animal Farm, there are some direct parallels within some of the character traits, let's just say that, particularly between Napoleon and Boris. <laughs> but yeah, not so much a fan, but also found it really interesting in terms of those cyclical themes within history that keep on repeating themselves in terms of where when do we not learn our lessons and also how people really have to hold key people in positions of power to account when they abuse those systems of power and take advantage of that before we get to a point where um, it's too late for ourselves. So yeah, gave me a little sense of fear as well. <laughs> the next one I want to discuss is Raymond Antrobus The Perseverance. Um, this is a collection of poems and it, they're just stunning. Like this again was another uh, one which was selected from the library as I was, had picked up safe. This was another one which was there. Um, and um, it's uh, from the perspective of someone who's deaf um, and someone who's exploring their heritage and identity and relationship with their father. Um, there's just some like really juicy salient pieces of poetry within there which are just very open and honest in the way they're describing 
what it meant to grow up um, not being able to hear and also the way people reacted and treated him at that time. My ear amps whistle as if singing to echo, goddess of noise, the ravel knot of tongues, of blaring birds, continent crumbs, of dull doorbells, sounds swamped in my misty hearing aid tubes. My name is Raymond Atrobus. I'm a poet, I'm a teacher. Some of the major themes in The Perseverance, I think, are to do with not, necess not necessarily just deafness or mixed race, like mixed heritage experience, um, but also communication, also language. When I was 12, I had um, a writing and reading age of a six-year-old. So because of my deafness being diagnosed so late, I've always felt like going through school, I was kind of having to overcompensate um, and try that extra, make that, those extra efforts to be able to catch up with the rest of my class. And I felt really self-conscious about that because I could see that the expectations of my teachers and to some extent my peers and my friends, it, everyone's expectation of me seemed to be so low and I could, I started to notice how that wasn't the case for some of my other friends who I would look at and speak with and be like, I feel like we're equally as intelligent. I don't understand why I'm being spoken to in such a way. So that's one challenge I feel I had to overcome just to write anything and, and to speak in any, in any way because I also did speech therapy and hearing therapy and all these things. If I'm reading poetry, I've, uh, I've learned that I have to give myself a greater amount of time than I would necessarily if I was reading. And I can't necessarily be d distracted in, in the same way. Like I couldn't be listening to, say, music or the TV couldn't be on. If I'm reading poetry, I have to very much be able to immerse myself in the task of reading through the poem. Anyway, that is all the things which I have read through the course of summer. Um, so if you have stayed till the end, Thank you, <laughs> because I appreciate that I have been reading a lot and I've basically downloaded onto you three months worth of reading or reads um, and they have all in their individual way been marvellous. Um, so it's been fun just to share some of those insights with you as well. I do hope to be a bit more consistent and regular with my uploads. Um, and yeah, I will talk to you properly sometime again soon. Okay, take care. Bye. Thank you.